Good evening, everyone. A patient walks into a booth with a car. With the swipe of that car, the doctor gets access to his entire medical history. Another person from his farm is making a video call to a specialist in the city and is discussing his health. Another scene there, a patient who is cured of an ailment thanks his doctor and with a swipe on his phone, revokes the doctor's access to his data. Or even better, an old man who is you know, pacing upstairs gets a message from his healthcare service provider asking him to slow down from the intel from his wearable. These are not scenes from sci-fi movies or something that will happen in the next century, but this is the digital dream that's being built for this nation of 135 crores people who are spread across cities that have sophisticated, sophisticated multi-speciality hospitals to remote villages who rely on primary healthcare centers for even mortal emergencies. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all to this edition of Chatinat that will be discussing about can India become a digital health nation. All political stances aside, our uh, Honorable PM's address, Independence Day address that was talking about uh, India being a digital health nation is a fantastic feat to attain the required efficiency, effectiveness and transparency of uh, healthcare in this country. But are we really up for it? So we have an excellent panel here that will be answering this question today. We have with us Dr. Arun, who is a practicing physiotherapist and also and also a principal of the College of Physiotherapy at Madhav University. His areas of expertise uh, span across yoga, natural therapy, acupuncture, and uh, Burma. So we are glad to have him, and we hope he'll bring uh, the scope of technology and alternative healthcare to today's discussion. Welcome, Dr. Arun. We have Bala here who after a successful stint of 15 years with the global consulting firm Accenture, particularly focusing on government and healthcare, is now leading a fast growing startup called Natural Minds, who is determined to bring technology to Indian healthcare ecosystem. Welcome Bala. So Bala will be bringing a critical global plus policymakers perspective to this discussion today. We have Dr. Manish Matu, COO, Fortis Healthcare. He's passionate about making healthcare delivery innovative accessible and profitable uh, while managing the patient or consumer's satisfaction, which is the most important of all. So he was the PNL strategy and operations of this multi-speciality hospital chain in Bengaluru. So he's also a medical doctor. So he brings the doctors plus the operations uh, perspective to today's discussion. And we have Ram Srinivasan. He has recently embarked on his entrepreneurial journey. So, uh, his team at Gumstad is building innovative and engaging video solutions that will uh, enrich the consumer experience across industries but their primarily focal point for now is telehealth and Ram also has a global experience that spans across two decades and his last stint with Microsoft he has dealt with digital transformation for manufacturers in India so we really understand what digital transformation is in India and we hope he'll bring some jugaad of how we can steer clear of the challenges that you know, that, that's there in the Indian context. And I am Papita Mohan. I had consulting at Adre, your digital uh, marketing services partner. So without further ado, I'll introduce the first topic of the day, the digital divide. So when we talk about the digital dream, it all boils down to how. So the reason pandemic has been a real slap on the face, while uh, India claims that we have the second largest internet using pool of population, most of our population do not have access to internet, right? The 80% of students have said that uh, they, have, they have not been able to access their online classes because of a lack of device or uh, lack of infrastructure. So I'll throw this question to you, Dr. Arun. How do you see this, um, I'm sorry, to Bala first and then Dr. Arun will be adding this point. So Bala, how do you see this uh, journey of digital transformation being inclusive in India? Yeah, I think you started up uh, pretty well with uh a dream status, right, of uh, a connected health. So that's that's the term, connected health. You know, across the globe, everybody is trying to really achieve. They're not uh, too successful, but it's um, absolutely successful in pockets, whether it's Singapore and the US and Australia, right, different regions and different hospital chains have achieved uh, what it is. Um, so your very specific question about digital divide i mean digital divide um, now when we talk about technology in healthcare it's a broader subject uh, we will i probably will limit into the information technology in healthcare you know rest of the people better off to talk about the 
deeper technologies in, in, in healthcare, right? So from the information technology perspective, there's a digital divide that we're all talking about. You know, we are in 2020, heading into 2021. What are the factors that are leading, you know, this divide to take in and then move on while in healthcare, we are pretty much a laggard. I would, it's, uh, it's more an opportunity than, a, a, you know, a kind of a, a concern. Let's look at the factors that are kind of leading into it. One of the things is to really see, you know, in India, India is a multicultural country, right? It's a pretty vast country. There is India, there is Bharat. You're talking about there's a rural and semi-urban areas, and then you talk about the metros and big cities on, and, and, you know, the, the way that the patients uh, come out, the way that the doctors are educated to really deal with. And the other is um, technology solution, right? So we've been talking about this for the past 10, 15 years. You've seen a lot of these LK technology companies that have come up in the past 15 years in India, right? The problems they were trying to address at the time is different than what's, uh, you know, it's out today. And the opportunities they had from the technology angle was different at that time than what it's today, right? So, you know, that's an evolution that, that's come out. Of course, there is a government willingness and the policy that is, um, you know, that, that needs to be put in place for, you know, people to see wider adoption of it. And more importantly, doctors are clinicians. The the mindset to really take technology, it's, it's not on a negative thing. It's more about, you know, how compelling is the technology solution for them to take in and see value out of it, right? That's very, very important. The solution that has been built so far, right, has been addressing commodity thing about, how do I take patient to the doctor? It's more about, you know, the appointments and schedulings and walking of the patients and, and so on, right? So things are changing now in 2020, in 2021, when the government is talking about a national digital health mission, you know, with, with COVID coming in, a lot of uh, learning that both the medical fraternity and people um, are, are carrying. One of the first things that, you know, I've seen people learn, not everybody, but vast majority of people, you don't need to walk in into a hospital or a clinic for every single problem that you have. Majority of it that could be dealt in a remote sense, but there is still, you know, the feel of, you know, there, there's still the, the mental block. It's still there for people. Is that something that would I get the same experience and so on, right? So probably that's where Gumstack could be coming into play and, you know, where are these solutions, video solution that's kind of helping in to move in. The second one, you know, if you look at technology wise, you know, a lot of advancement happened right now. We talk about cloud, mobile enablement and the IOTs, all these have evolved from what it used to be 10, 15 years ago. Game is shifting. The, the agents that are required for the change are all in place. So scalability, it's all in place. But the companies that had kind of started 10, 15 years ago, when they, you know, seen the opportunities to address was more around the periphery. Now it's the time that you have to really bring in the connected health solution. So that's where startup like ourselves, right? There are a few others. It's not just the natural minds that I present out here. So these are the companies which are coming and looking to play a change agent. What are we talking about? We're talking about, okay, interconnected ecosystem, right? So it is more about taking in, you know, an experience for a patient to walk into the doctor's office, either walk in or teleconsultation, doesn't matter. You know, have an encounter with the doctor, you know, consulting them. And then, you know, there is a connection from there into the pharmacies and the laboratories for a, for an integrated experience solution. Now, if you extend it and see that this patient record is made available, of course, controlled by the patients in terms of consent, but, you know, the data continues to, you know, you, you keep accumulating and you provide the continuity, right? Today, a, a patient can walk in into a hospital. Three months later, a patient could be going into a different city, into a different clinic, but the data is available for the doctors to really use to diagnose and kind of examine and then, you know, do the treatment. It's going to be a lot more powerful and valuable because then they don't end up doing just symptomatic treatment on the patients. It's about you know, the history of the patient comes into the fore for them. So the quality of healthcare will improve. People like us, you know, come in and try to find an opportunity to bring in, you know, the change and, and help the industry change. I will probably give you a couple of examples uh, from the recent times, you know, my, you know, personal example of, you know, what we've uh, uh, seen. Uh, so there's a, um, uh, there's a doctor who consults in Bangalore in a large corporate hospital, right? So. A patient called up the hospital for an appointment with the doctor, but unfortunately the doctor had left. Uh, he's in our platform and then, you know, he had given our um, card to them, right? So whenever a patient calls me off the period, 
ask him to call me here. So the patient got into our system, took an appointment. The patient was very, very worried because it's a pediatric uh, specialist and, and it's, it's a child. And, you know, if I'm there, I would have been equally worried because I never experienced, you know, doing a teleconsultation with a doctor personally myself. So it's going to be very, very concerning, especially you, you're putting your kid on, on, on friend. But when he went through that and the experience was so, you know, good. So, you know, he came back saying that, you know what, the, the mental block I had about, you know, doing a teleconsultation is gone. I'm pretty happy with the experience. I kind of felt a near in-person experience. I would be happy doing that. It needs that experience for a change in mindset, you know, both for the doctors as well as the patient. So it's not going to be a, I would say it's not an easy change. But are the people ready to change? The answer is yes, because the situation that, you know, put in and the opportunity that come in, you know, in a place is that. The other one is, you know, there is a um, doctor with us who is based in Mumbai, is a plastic surgeon. And uh, there's a lady from Asayam, Guwahati. I mean, she uh, had uh, some of those facial uh, issues. So she got into a call with them. And, and it is a, just a, you know, regular call. And, and it's, of course, you know, you put it, put it across our platform for a teleconsultation. Uh, again, you know, it's coincidentally, it's just a teleconsultation. But what happened is they could talk to the level of comfort and the doctor could assess based on this conversation, what is the kind of issue that she has? It needs a higher quality video consultation, right? It needs the yeah. ability to really help. You know, it's, it's not just a WhatsApp type of stuff. So um, end of the conversation, right? A doctor could go to the extent of saying, What's the next step? The next step is to undergo a, a minor surgery. And these are the things that I'll have to do on. And the patient was convinced about this. So they set the surgery on thereafter, right? Of course, yeah. surgery will have to do it in person, right? Well, it would be, would be interesting to also hear in the same context, uh, Dr. Manish's thoughts. Now, why I'm asking this is, you know, uh, interesting points that you brought up uh, would be would be interesting to basically juxtapose what you just said uh, as service providers or technology providers we are always gung-ho about it but it will be interesting to basically hear dr manish present the provider's point of view in this i'm just uh, being curious on that yeah thanks ram i, I think i think bala has said the context extremely well uh, from a provider's perspective in fact we don't see it as a competition at all there are a lot of needs of the customer that we are unable to fulfill because we are not a technology company we we believe we are just providers of healthcare and that's what our expertise is. But what's happening is that uh, simultaneously, there's a big market ecosystem getting created around hospitals with companies like Net Natural Nines and others, which are actually helping us connect better with patients. And it's not just for appointments and consultations, but post-operative care as well. There's a huge opportunity in ambulatory care that's coming about because of you know startups like uh, many startups, uh, you know, and that ecosystem actually getting by, better by the day. And we see ourselves in a position to, while we, uh, you know, fulfill our, uh, uh, you know, responsibilities as uh, core clinical providers, but uh, we feel that uh, with these tracks parallelly converging, the patients will have a much better experience and much better outcome. So we're very happy with the way this ecosystem is, is developing. Thank you, Dr. Manish. So, like Bala pointed out, more than anything else, this pandemic has been the real change agent in terms of a lot of industries, not just healthcare. So, I'd like to hear from Dr. Arun because uh, physiotherapy is a space that absolutely requires physical contact, is what our assumptions and experiences so far has been. So, so I'll point the same question to you, Dr. Manish, then. Uh, as Indians, we just don't go to doctors for the intelligence quotients, okay? We really look for good doctors who make us feel good. That experience of being near a doctor and being comforted by the words and care that you get is, is the, you know, telehealth service as effective in terms of that experience? Well, I mean, to be fair, no, but I don't think telehealth is an option anymore. It's an inevitability. And because the... Uh, you know, for the comfort of a few people, I think the needs and, and demands of a larger nation, uh, you know, we can't compromise on that. And the reality is, as Bala also pointed out earlier and Ram alluded to, that the, the needs of the consumers and the patients, both in rural and urban areas, actually far outweigh the supply right now. The demand is much more than what we are supplying. Uh, you know, in, in hospitals and urban areas, the need is of convenience and precision care. Uh, in uh, in rural areas, the need is of basic primary and secondary care. Uh, in ambulatory care scenario, the need is of convenience for patients. And largely, there is a need to connect the supplier of care to the uh, to where the patient is. So 
so i think while it may not be convenient i mean the the, the short answer is that uh why one on one side it, it is an inevitable and it's going to happen and i'm very sure that startups or tech technology companies will refine their offerings uh, at a much uh, you know rapid pace um you know fueled by the technology that we are having whether it's cloud or ai or analytics or you know 5g network for example for that matter there's a lot of technological advances that are happening that will make such experiences as telehealth much much better in future and probably help both the patients in urban areas as well as rural areas so if that's that's the uh, you know inevitable truth that we are facing what happens to the state of the art infrastructure that these uh, hospital chains have invested in because uh, the utilization of those capacities may not be the same when the telehealth is full steam you know so there are two categories of technologies that are being experimented with in hospitals right so because eventually if we are investing in a technology there has to be a return on investment somewhere right so i feel while the need is there for any technology to be uh, you know it's obvious uh, but there are certain technologies which pro- which are you know currently providing incremental benefits to the patients like for example um, eicus you know that's a fabulous technology that has been around for a while but because of covid we've seen accelerated adoption of that technology uh, then we have of course telehealth as i mentioned you know consultations uh, happening uh, online today uh, and in pandemic 30% of our traffic across fortis hospitals actually shifted online which was about 5% pre covid then we have technological shifts advances happening in every equipment whether it's ultrasounds ct scans mris and so on and so forth or even surgical robots for that matter so there are technologies that are actually being uh, invested in by the hospitals where the utilization is fairly good uh, and the the reimbursements whether it's from the patients or the payers or the insurers is there so you know it's it's easier for hospitals to invest in such technologies and see the utilization however uh, there is also I want to add here sorry please oh, uh, so i think like what dr manish is talking about right it's um, it's a blessing right to have these kind of technology like a telehealth it doesn't really take away right what uh, the larger hospital setup is you still need to go to a hospital for you know doing an ultrasound right to doing an x-ray doing an mri right so the hospital is not really you know taking away you know, or or getting uh, disturbed this they 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 not really so with this telehealth coming in it's more the, the funneling so the the channelizing of these patient flow there's so many patients not able to get uh, you know the attention in the hospitals largely because of uh, lack of appointments lack of you know it, it's it's a crowd coming in it, it becomes very difficult you go go into aims right you don't really get you know your appointment that easily but you're kind of moving away those uh, patients into telehealth that doesn't require a in person you know hospital visit right so you take away the large crowd so it's something like you see the banking system that went through maybe 20 years ago so you know people have to really get into to a teller to really collect your money and so on right later on when atm came in right some of the banks you know charge you a fees if you go inside and and, and withdraw your money so change the behavior of the people right so when you need to truly do a banking transaction beyond your standard you know withdrawal at passive you go and otherwise you stay out so that's the kind of a quality we're talking about doesn't really take away anything so, so that's a big one uh, I mean, that's when we we're talking about the mental block from uh, the patient's perspective right i'd like to understand how doctors are comfortable uh, with uh, telehealth service yeah. sure uh, I'll, i'll just uh, post this question i allow ram to uh, add his perspective then i'll uh, get the sure. answer for the question from dr manish or dr ram yeah so uh, it's it's I'm, i'm going to add on to what you just said a couple of uh, thoughts that came to me when dr manish you were going through it and when we started working on this area uh, we met a gynecologist the refrain was you know what if i don't kind of uh, feel for the baby that the person is carrying i can't say what she is going through telemedicine is 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 all great uh, you know it doesn't mean anything for me on the flip side uh, when i look at data in the us obgen is the third largest adopter of telemedicine uh, in the us uh, so that that kind of is, is a dissonance that i'm struggling with uh, the second part of the question is uh, also going back to what you just talked about for telemedicine will not survive the pandemic if it doesn't have a innate value for hospitals to run with uh, It, it's important to understand that it's it's the it's not the demand side that's that's struggling in India. It's the supply side that's struggling in India. 
And the interesting part that I'm looking at is as I work with hospitals, uh, the moment we patients started walking into the OPDs, uh, doctors and hospitals have started saying that, look, I don't want to do tele teleconsulting anymore because I don't have time for it. How are you handling these aspects? No, you, I think they hit the nail on its head that it was probably, uh, I think, compulsion of the pandemic that forced doctors to adopt. But, you know, we have to understand the concerns first and try and address that so and, and try and make it quick. The first concern is privacy of data. The patient uh, doctor interaction is it private or not will it be used against the doctor in case something goes wrong the doctor is a little wary of that second thing is the quality of interaction is always not smooth um, you know there are technical issues and you know audio video issues and of course the the basic platform issues but the third and most important aspect which you touched upon is that there is no physical feel of the patient you don't get to examine the patient and doctors are challenged in making a diagnosis and of course treatment and tomorrow the doctor could be held liable if something goes wrong. So these are very, very serious concerns. And if doctors are hesitant in uh, you know, adopting this technology completely, I think they are right. And fourth, of course, is the mindset issue also. There is a certain segment of doctors which are just so averse to using new technology. But that I would say is about 25-30%. But the balance three factors that I mentioned, if those are addressed, you will see a large scale adoption towards the technology because it is convenient for sure and it helps doctors widen their patient base. But coming back to the, so, so, so that's one part of it. And, and you, as you rightly said, if these are not addressed, I don't think telehealth will survive, survive the pandemic. Interesting point of view. I think uh, I'll allow you to finish it, but I'll go back to something that Bala brought up in terms of his connected health story. And, and in terms of looking at it, uh, I was looking at, I'll take the story of the gynecologist itself. Uh, I was looking at what why Obgen uh, is one of the third largest adopter in terms of telemedicine and, uh, and, and digital health in the US and why not in India. We seem yeah. to be basically looking at Obgen only from the point of view of delivery, but uh, Obgen in itself uh, has uh, you know multiple different uh, aspects to it, from PCOS to uh, menopause to various other aspects, which are all coming under the concept of LTPAC, that is uh, long-term post-acute care aspects of it. Uh, I think uh, at this point of time, we are seeing telemedicine and a very 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 narrow point of view and a very myopic point of view. Uh, I think uh, uh, across the ecosystem, there is, uh, there is there needs to be a rethink of this aspect of it if we have to basically adopt it consistently. Yeah, I really agree with the Dr. Manish. Uh, the uh, technology will not survive if it is not updated and if it is not user friendly in the coming forth because already we have started with our practice. Being a physical therapist, the name itself specifies that we need physical touch of the patient. So. Um, and the, uh, the restrictions and the uh, limitations what a physician faces are much lesser than uh, the limitations what we face uh, in handling patients and uh, particularly patients with neurological deficits it's going to be very tough uh, physicians are coming up with some ideas where they are uh, sending people doorstep to assess the vitals and whatever uh, the uh, investigations the uh, senior doctor wanted to do somebody else is going doorstep to do it like sort of an augmented uh, uh, augmented uh, technology with uh, physical uh, support and the uh, chief doctor would be able to perceive what, are, what is the patient actually undergoing because there is one guy to help uh, the doctor to give information but for us it is going to be very difficult uh, that is one thing second thing is uh, as someone rightly pointed that we have an apprehension towards uh, technology as a, a practitioner we have an apprehension and the interdisciplinary research is not happening right from the grassroots level like uh, from the university level the interdisciplinary research is just done for namesake because being in this field the uh, university grants commission the ugc always emphasize on an interdisciplinary research but that never happens it happens over paper Another important thing is we are lacking in funding for innovations. We have a lot of innovations in the field of rehabilitation, but we are lacking uh, direction and we are lacking in uh, uh, where to go and apply for fund. Or, so that, that knowledge is lacking in majority of the people. So the innovation goes in vain most of the time. And uh, the, the uh, positivity of this uh, pandemic period for healthcare profession is the accessibility of the uh, uh, people who are all these time being uh, the knowledgeable people are accessible to everyone. Everybody has started a YouTube channel and uh, they are uh, putting up their information. We are more accessible nowadays. 
uh, why I am here in this platform is all because of uh, technology. Because uh, a guy from uh, uh, Madras Mindworks helped me to uh, upgrade my technological knowledge. And now, see, you see, if you see, my direction is entirely changed. All these 15 years, I was working in one direction, and now I'm working in a different direction towards virtual reality. So definitely, there are a lot of uh, positivities out of this. But we should be malleable in uh, handling this. Uh, uh, wherever it is uh, indispensable, we have to use it. And uh, we have to stick on with the uh, conventional things wherever it is needed. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arun, for adding that. Because uh, the point that you told about rehabilitation is a very important point. Because when we say healthcare, our thoughts are skewed towards physical healthcare. There's also another side to it, mental healthcare. Right, so pain management. So these are some areas where technology has a lot of scope to play. What are your, your views on this, Dr. Manish? Yeah, that is tremendous. The uh, contribution of technology, particularly the virtual rehabilitation for pain, is going to be the future of uh, uh, rehabilitation. Because always now, uh, the uh, conventionally we have dealt only with the physique of a person. Now we have gone to the physical plateau and the mental plateau, and in future, who knows? It can go to the cosmic plateau also. Now it is any disease is dealt in aspect of a, a human interacting with the environment, how the environment and human and the task what the the individual performs determines the treatment nowadays. Uh, if you could vary the ambience, if you could vary the environment of the patient, you can replace the negative emotions of the patient with positive emotions, and that is going to do wonders for patients, and particularly in chronic pain management. VR is the future and uh, it is catching up in Western countries, but because of the uh, feasibility and accessibility to these costly equipments and uh, this mental block of uh, our uh, healthcare workers towards technology is the one which is stopping us from updating ourselves. And uh, the affordability of the patients is also another uh, uh, limitations here. All patients who are having chronic pain may not be accessible to a sitting of VR which would come around 1000 rupees per session. It is not going to be possible for them. But if you see overall expenditure, what they do towards that pain, uh, this is a very meager amount. Uh, but somebody should take this technology to general public. And community based research is very, very essential for such uh, changes to happen. I, yeah. I, I would add, uh, Dr. Arun, you know, about the pricing aspect, right? So when mobile phone hit india way back in mid 90s right so it used to be bricks what they call nokia bricks it used to be very expensive right i mean at that time your average indian salary must be in three figures and you know it used to be seven eight thousand bucks uh, and then you know uh, every minute is going to be you know 10 15 bucks so on right and see the kind of a price today it's all about you know adoption right when they kind of get in they probably will start it when vr is more penetrated you're going to see uh, cheaper technology so technology in itself would be a cheaper proposition, right? When you kind of spread the volume. Just to, you know, yeah. uh, interesting point uh, add here is the smartphone penetration in India is at anywhere between 28 to 30%. Much of whatever we are talking about. Uh, and, and the interesting part is this 28 to 30% is also predominantly in the urban areas, in the catchment areas of some of the largest hospitals. Uh, so it's, it's going to be one interesting question that we need to answer for ourselves saying that, look, uh, we do have a significant digital divide. Going back to what you started with, Pavitha, that's a problem that we need to solve for if we need to really push uh, telemedicine as an area uh, to, 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 to multiple different uh, parts of the country. So I can I can add here, here Ram, right, about the telemedicine as a thing. So by the way, you know, I just want to remind what we are talking about digital divide is not telemedicine. It's about digitalization of the patient record right so it's also keeping the records keeping the history even if it's not telemedicine access it right but when you talk about this uh, mobile solutions right where smartphones are just about 30 percent people i will also let you know that we are working with multiple governments of course you know early stages but the various state governments are looking to launch what's called a kiosk right telemedicine kiosk in the rural areas so you don't have um, a device yourself, you can walk into the kiosk. Uh, Natural Minds is also doing it. I mean, we're also working with partners. What we're doing is we're kind of launching what's called virtual clinics. So we help hospitals and, and, and big chains of hospitals to penetrate, right? To Dr. Manish point, a friend, right? So it's so much that, you know, one could do to reach uh, the, the population. 
and, and not just us. I mean, there are quite a few others who are also doing it. So it's about taking the solution into packaging it into a kiosk kind of a thing and then deploying in various places. The network connectivity is vast improved with Jio and Airtel and various other places, you know, competing with each other pan India. The, the network reach is, is, is quite vast, right? So one would be able to reach into those areas to provide a rural health solution. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Balu, for that because telemedicine or not, uh, digital healthcare is larger than that and is handling with uh, patient data and what we can reap out of that data, right? While we see that in a recent survey, 76% of healthcare professionals say that they handle only digital uh, medical records of their patients. We also see digital surveys being uh, typed out on Word and being printed and shared, sometimes even handwritten. So, what is the reality there, Dr. Manish? So, how is patient data being handled and uh, is there a possibility for uh, having algorithm, algorithmic uh, analytics on top of it? I, I was actually going to mention that, you know, while telehealth is an important aspect of digitization of healthcare or digitalization of healthcare, um, it's still only about 10, 15 to 20 percent of the overall digital landscape of the of the industry. But yes, it's the starting point. The second question is that it's beyond telehealth, where do we go? And that's where digitization of healthcare records comes into play. And Bala mentioned that without a digitization of those healthcare records, I don't think this journey will move forward because that's the starting point or the foundation block of any kind of analytics or AI induced platforms that we plan to use in future. So as far as our journey is concerned, I, I sorry to say, but I think that's the biggest stumbling block in our country right now. There's very minimal adoption towards of digital healthcare records in the country, uh, barring a few urban centers or a few hospitals. Largely, it's still manual. I think that's where the biggest challenge is. Challenge in urban areas is that if we don't digitize, we'll never be able to use that data for uh, you know management of chronic health issues of patients. We will never be able to use ever predictive analytics, uh, you know, in in our ICUs in our wards. Because that's where we should be heading towards. I remember in Obamacare, there was a big push towards electronic health records. And whatever progress the country has made in the last 10 odd years is because there was a push from the government for digitization of health records. Unless that kind of movement happens in our country, we, are, we will never be able to unlock the true potential. And especially in rural areas where both the challenges in affordability and accessibility, unless we digitize some sort of it, it will continue and continue to be a big issue. So while in urban areas, the advantages of digitization are more precision care, better care, better outcomes and convenience in rural areas, it will just about address the basic issues of accessibility and affordability. So just to reinforce, unless we digitize our healthcare records and, you know, it's it's a long process. We'll have to have another webinar for that. <laughs> I think we'll just be able, we, we will never be able to unlock the true potential of what digitization offers for healthcare. Yeah, I was I was stumped when I heard a data point uh, in one of the earlier conversations. We are a country of abundance in terms of technology professionals, which shows in the fact that for a country which has around 15,000 hospitals of a particular size, there are anywhere between 3,000 to 5,000 medical data you know, EMR, EHR, the rudimentary EMR, EHR providers in this country. And, and you know, if this kind of a condition exists, you are not going to ever digitize records in a worthwhile manner. Uh, I do not know how. I, I hope NDHM makes a break into that. But uh, we are a country of excesses in many ways. And this is another excess that I don't know how we are. Very, very interesting insight. I must say, Ram, very interesting. Actually, sir, uh, the uh, reason for not digitalizing the records is uh, there is no demand. For, there is no uh, insurance uh, system that is functioning to question the uh, physicians or uh, the healthcare workers about the statistics or data or uh, the evidence-based practice what they do so uh, in rural areas and in predominantly all the clinics they don't digitalize the uh, records and now if you see the uh, the uh, international publications of all the healthcare workers are uh, zooming up in india because of the uh, policies devised by the uh, indian medical system as well as the uh, educational system which demands of more uh, international publication so this is the time people are realizing what is the need for uh, data 
the medical for medical professional information was very important all these states now uh, data is becoming more important for uh, us there are a lot of retrospective studies which are being done uh, retrospective studies can be done only with digital records very easily compared to manual records so now i think this is the right scenario and this is the uh, right time for technology to creep in uh, now uh, the uh, interdisciplinary work should start if you see now uh, it, uh, we are not only dependent on the the educational bodies to support us we have a lot of entrepreneurs now uh, around us we have lot of lots and lots of entrepreneurs who are ready to give shape to our uh, innovations so that is a very encouraging scenario we all came to know about this because we had a halt during this covid we stood a minute we looked around we have we analyzed what are all the resources we do have and we changed direction that is what i would uh, classically define this period of 2020 and uh, i think this is the right time we have to uh, invest more time on this uh, interdisciplinary approach dr arnachalan take a look at a company called drief case d r i e f c a s e uh, these guys are interesting they are saying that they will digitize existing records for a price Perfect. thank you thank you so doctor. while we are discussing about data i think i see a shift of the ownership of data going from the hospitals to the patients right i have a question here ram uh, is the last indian ready to understand and have you know handle the ownership of his own data is there a scope for uh, mobile apps there because our policy also mentions that there is going to be an open market where uh, people will be encouraged to develop mobile apps under the umbrella of my health what are your views there the interesting question i have multiple uh, you know uh, interest aspects to this and i have uh, uh, tracked this for a long time say so let's talk about first mobile apps i think it's important that we don't end up in the same way mobile payments were at some point right everyone were doing their part of it and and everyone were basically running their own aspects to it the interesting part is the open ecosystem that you know the government is trying to put in place in terms of ndhm and and i strongly believe it should uh, it should come through can really help in ensuring that you know while there are multiple different ways of experience that can be delivered it should not basically become multiple different silos that get created right uh, multiple different silos are not scalable in our world the second part that we need to think about is mobile applications is mobile applications in itself the end of all i don't think so that's why um, our earlier conversation comes up saying that look mobile applications in itself might not answer everything because smartphone penetration is still a long way away in our country uh, what will mobile applications bring to the table is it can really help uh, move some of the episodic care that happens today uh, away to continuous care you know uh, the the episodic care that is happening today with uh, the the affluent population which which can access a smartphone can move away when, uh, that can lead to a couple of things one is uh there could be a significant change in terms of availability of time for uh, care providers to address others who are available and need to be addressed and so on the other thing that mobile apps can really bring to the table is you know not just in terms of uh, the, the digitization of data at the back end along with the mobile apps can allow patients to to not postpone their uh, care to the flu to when a episode happens right uh, you cannot inform people if you could not cannot reach them it it is important that you know there is a strong adoption of this that uh, happens across the country among the smartphone using population for them to be able to continuously care for you know photos can do that you know continuous uh, care providers like uh, natural minds can do it uh, and and it can only happen when Uh, there is a strong understanding of uh, patients and uh, i'm not talking about patients patients but the the population at large seeing value out of this so let me add here a bit on this uh, mobile app solution your question is about you know can we trust the health data in the hands of the mobile uh, in the hands of the people who may may not really have uh, the ability to handle it but let's look at the banking system the whole of the banking system is you know now in the mobile with paytm and so much of digital wallets you know mobile banks and so on right so people are able to handle it who is able to handle it and it right you have a checks and balance that you can put in place but the fact is that the journey what is needed is the journey you know you may get the whole of the population in the next 3 years 5 years 8 years but it's the journey that you get in right so the people who you know get uh, actuated into it but you know let's take smartphone 
15 years ago when you know Steve Jobs came up with Apple you know the first 3 gs came in not many people would have believed that you know it would you know penetrate so much now you know you get into the semi urban rural areas a lot of you know smartphone users are out there as well so it's just about the journey it just you know gets across and technology just penetrates into the market and i believe that you know healthcare is again pretty much the same you trust healthcare as much as healthcare data as much as what your uh, financial data that you trust in right it's going to have very similar set of uh, safeguards and privacy that you maintain but end of the day you know it, it's not everybody who is who is going to be champion so you know like what ram is pointing out about 3000 or people 5000 technology not everybody having the kind of a vision to provide uh, a robust and quality solution some has a very you know limited vision of what they're trying to address but eventually what's going to happen is a handful of us will probably will come out and then will provide end to end you know solutions and services that gets adopted more but yes the journey is is good and with you no know, digital health mission coming up which is uh, you know the, some of the states have started adopting it right and there are data that started moving in it's just a matter of time we're going to see that they bring in the standardization and the infrastructure needed for all of us to you know thrive in i uh, i would just like to make a quick point here that you know one of the key enablers of a larger adoption of technology in healthcare uh, and that's i feel on one of the key enablers of any technology to uh, increase in its adoption and increase in scale has to be somebody has to be a mechanism of somebody paying for that technology one of the biggest drawbacks in the country is that healthcare is still perceived to be a a, a free uh, service you know it we are very socialist in our mindset while you know we moved <laughs> couple of uh, notches up there as far as modernization and liberalization is concerned but healthcare is still perceived to be a service which shouldn't be charged for and unless that mindset changes either inherently in the consumers or the government this creates a mechanism to pay for it i think we'll be limited in our adoption of technology and you know the ecosystem of startups and people trying to do different things will always be hampered the the average profit margins of hospitals listed hospitals in india at around 3% or less than that yeah slightly higher but yeah, as compared to financial institutions and uh, you know the other manufacturing industry and it's it's, it's a cause we have this intuition that uh, these large hospital chains make you know lump sum uh, profit so that's the very that's interesting the irony. yeah that's <laughs> the irony of irony of it all yeah it's about how medical industry planning is planning to consolidate data and analyze patient and practitioner data dr manish would you take this Sorry, question uh, I, I, yeah yeah so the the road map is that we start first by digitizing the data first step that we have to do we i think the biggest problem lies that unless we digitize the data uh and standardize it uh make it you know compliant to privacy laws you know of the country and then assimilate that data and then analyze it i think you know i'm talking about 3 4 years out uh but i think the first step the most crucial step is how do we move from manual to uh digital health record uh, and then start analyzing it a question that pop that's branched to the same answer that uh, dr manish is telling us now uh, in, ter- in terms of having electronic uh, medical data interface how is that interaction happening between um, insurance service providers and hospitals today because there's a lot of time lag and documentation that's happening there how do you see this happening see there are two kinds of data uh, largely one is the financial data which is what the insurers are looking at and the other is the clinical data you know so the interaction between the insurers and the hospitals is actually fairly okay because the financial data of billing a little bit of you know uh, uh, the medical history and all that is available but when you go back and actually try and look at the pure clinical data which is more extensive more uh, you know wider uh, there i think a lot of work has to be done so while it does not impact the relationship between insurers and hospitals it does impact our journey of uh, becoming able to uh restore the data analyze their data and make better decisions for patients the world has aspects such as fhir uh, fire which is which is available but i don't think so india is anywhere near such level of interoperability i think we need to look at uh, you know a, a ecosystem which is more like an upi which comes together which creates a, a core stack which which is significantly stronger than the individual parts that exist today perfect wrong in the same breath there is a question about having more compute power in the edge or what they call as fog computing is there a need for more computing power is that relevant let me add to it but bala would be better person to answer that uh, uh, i think he is uh, you know i'm i'm very focused on the video as a part 
uh, what would be interesting is I don't think so. Compute power in itself is is a, is a major aspect today. Uh, when access to uh, digitization, like Dr. Manish talked about, is, is still a, a long way away. Compute power will only come in when the digital data that is available is significantly higher, and you yep. are able to analyze it. Uh, second thing is when you talk about the edge, the edge comes only when decisions can be taken at the edge. Uh, decisions at the edge are a long, long, long way away. Medical area will be the last place to basically look at edge. Uh, just for your uh, information, uh, I've worked on edge-related areas, and no one wants to go anywhere near it with respect to automotive. Anywhere that the safety and security is a major question, uh, no provider takes a responsibility for it. Even today, with respect to connected vehicles in the US, no one knows who's going to take the uh, risk of uh, outcomes. Medical technology is a long way away from in terms of edge. Thank you, Ram. Pala, do you have to add uh, to the question? Well, Ram covered it pretty well. I think the, the point is, it isn't an issue today. It's primarily the data has to flow, the digitalization, and then, you know, penetration of uh, digitalizing records and usage of that, right? Uh, the flow is most important now. When you have that kind of, a, you know, the volume, then you know the, the service providers automatically will kind of scale up so that's not going to be an issue right you never had this issue with any cloud operators so far they've always stayed a step ahead uh, but currently there's no consumption so you know that's the issue. that is not an issue sure the next question uh, as far as patients are concerned 99 percent of them don't leave their district in that sense how does interoperability help so I think I will take this question because uh, not everything in the policy uh, might be applicable to everyone, right? But it's still empowering to have an option of you not know, changing the hospital, changing the doctor where your uh, data is stored and is uh, largely available in the ecosystem and is not restricted to a particular service provider. And the next question is about the role of government as an entity. That's a very critical question. I think. Uh, Bala, would you be able to take that because they are asking if the lack of such entity is the reason that only high-end technologies are not able to gain confidence of stakeholders like patient providers and payers, unlike the US. Well, it is not. It's it's about the you know the conviction, the necessity that you know both the doctors and the patient, the key stakeholders, uh, see to it. Um, I think the government policy is very essential, right? I mean, without a policy, it's going to be very difficult to really bring in. So then, you know, the Ram's point about 3,000, 5,000 players, you know, trying to provide a solution, each one providing differently. And, and to Dr. Manish's point about, you know, uh, the technology doesn't, you know, the, the healthcare industry don't see value for technology or don't see, a, a, you know, the price, right? If, if you say free, people are not really going to sustain. I mean, there are so many operators, you know, which we all know about, you know, they're all bleeding. I mean, they're all servicing, you know, the healthcare industry, that these are technology players, but they are all bleeding because they're not able to provide to a price point that is actually needed. So this is needed to, you know, to go beyond thinking beyond just the cost. It is more about, you know, how do we really, you know, bring in more players today, you know, Dr. Manish in his Fortis hospital, you know, everything would have been digitalized. But when you get out into the market, you know, there's so much of OPD clinics, right? A small hospital, medium hospitals, either they don't really get the right technology or they don't know how to really get it and what's the value of it. So you don't see them, you know, use as much as it is. So policy will bring in those and thereby, you know, the patient records, you know, starts getting digitalized. The, the, the closest answer that I can give is looking at the financial services industry. Uh, the UPI, the biggest innovation or capability that India has done and that has revolutionized our digital payments industry uh, is a non-governmental initiative. Government staying out of this is the best thing that they can do to, uh, to the Indian innovation, not putting their minds into it. I, I'm a very strong believer in it and I hope they continue to do so. And, and uh, to other question, that interesting question that you asked about is 99% uh, of people are in uh, smaller districts. Uh, what is the value of interoperability? I don't think so. It's uh, while 99% of them are in smaller districts, uh, where it becomes very interesting is, uh, you know, standardization of uh, data, uh, in, including capture of data. Today, the biggest question I think Dr. Manish can answer this is, if I take uh, a set of measurements, whatever it be, it could be blood count, it could be anything, uh, in, in a place A and go to Fortis, uh, the doctors at Fortis are not comfortable taking that data up. 
right? Uh, and, and that's because uh, they are not sure whether the, the kind of uh, calibration that has been done at place A is equivalent to what has been done at Fortis. Uh, unless we basically solve for these aspects, interoperability is not going to come up. And when these aspects are done at even district levels, the data will flow all the way to a Fortis of the world. Absolutely right. And in just to summarize, government should become a payer, not a provider. You know, the inefficiencies of, you know, with government actually providing everything from medical education to primary clinics, to tertiary clinics are so many. And, uh, you know, we lose so much of money uh, that that's one part of the problem. And the second part of the problem is the budget allocation. You know, our defense allocation as a percentage of GDP is actually 11 percent. But our healthcare allocation is about two and a half percent. So it gives you an idea of how the government priorities are. So that's got to change. And of course, I mean, there should be government regulation because there are a lot of people who need that kind of support from the government side, but they should leave the running of hospitals, running of healthcare to private operators. Government should, be, government should basically become the Uber. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They should be asset light and they should run the system, not basically own the asset in itself. So the next question is about the market players being tied up with uh, corporates to provide co chronic healthcare and prevention capabilities to the employees. So typically our consultancy, ser consultancy services offered uh, and what is the potential for the same? Yeah, I mean, it's a great idea, but you know, then corporates have to be willing to kind of create some sort of a mechanism through which it can be a long term relationship. Right now, our relationship is very episodic. The employee falls sick, goes to the hospital, and corporate pays for it. That's the end of the story. Hospitals would also like to enter into the relationship where we manage the patients long term, especially for lifestyle diseases, um, you know, mental wellness, and so on and so forth. But uh, you know, this kind of model has to be either facilitated by corporates themselves or the insurers. Somebody has to do, has to do it. So unless that happens, I, I, I think it's a great idea, but it needs uh, kind of participation from think, everybody, uh, including the insurers. That's a very interesting answer. I'll just give you a couple of data points on this. Uh, Teledoc in the US sold to employees. Uh, and and uh, what that led to is uh, they basically sold a package to through the insurers to the employees. The employees paid for it. But the utilization of the Teledoc services was at 5%. And, and that's a lot of value wasted and there is a lack of adoption. And, you know, if that kind of uh, thing exists, it's, it's going to be a, a loose loose for multiple people. And I don't think so. That's a great idea. So we will have to find ways in which it's more continuous care and outcome based care than just, you know, finding ways uh, in which uh, you have a business model run out of this. Perfect. What a fantastic session. We just lost track of time. And thank you so much, panelists, Dr. Arun, uh, Dr. Manish, Bala, and Ram for being part of our Paid Forward Fireside chat series, Chatting Art. Um, there are 4,900 startups today in India working in the healthcare space. And we have agile service providers, doctors like uh, Dr. Manish and Dr. Arun. And we have technocrats who are so passionate about making a change in the space, like Bala and Ram. So uh, India can really be a digital health nation, but there's some action that needs to be done by both all of us uh, as individuals, as citizens of India, as well as the technologists and policy makers and healthcare providers themselves. Thank you so much for joining us today. Until we meet you in the next edition of Chatinad in 2021, take care, have a happy holiday, happy new year to all of you.